Can I refill your eggnog for you? Get you something to eat? Drive you out to the middle of nowhere? Leave you for dead? No, I'm doing just fine, Clark. Live from the place where the appetizers are weak, but the eggnog runs strong, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and the annual basement holiday party is just starting. OG's already over in the corner, not talking to anyone. Joe's trying to con the fin, turn into bobbin for apples. But hey, whoa, who's that? Our party just got a lot better because here to talk about a nightmare stat from Fidelity that 2018 might be rough and a piece calling 401k plans weak, we welcome from the Inspired Money podcast, Andrew Wang. Also, from Afford Anything, Paula Pant. But hey, that's not all. Worried about saving for college or maybe looking for an easy last minute holiday gift into a college fund? Joining us today from College Backer to talk about that and more We welcome Abby Chow. And now, just to stop him from trying to lead the Macarena, let's welcome Joe Salcihai. I'm great at leading the Macarena. I don't know what what you're talking about, Doug. Hey, everybody, I am Joe Salcihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. Welcome to the holiday season. I'm so excited that this is our last week of 2017. In fact, our last show of 2017. And boy, do we have a great one for you. Let's start off in the sunny town of Las Vegas, Nevada, where I believe Paula Pant from Afford Anything joins me. I am joining you wearing a tank top and shorts. That is how amazing it is in uh, sunny Las Vegas, Nevada in December. Now, you grew up in Cincinnati, right? I did. Someone had to. Do you, do you do you always Cincinnati people direct your hate mail to Paula at? <laughs> yeah, not to me. The because I love Cincinnati. But 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 do you feel kind of like a faker not having the the snow on the ground and the cold chill in the air? Oh no no! I've put in my time. I spent uh, many many winters in places where it's cold. Both growing up in Cincinnati and then later living in Colorado. Quick fun story. So my sister lives in Australia. This is her first time coming to the United States for, uh, oh, for the holidays. That is first awesome. Time, first time coming to the United States ever, actually. And uh, and she timed it to come for Christmas, thinking that she would get to experience a white Christmas. Unfortunately, she's going to be in L.A. and Las Vegas. And I tr- <laughs> I've been trying to explain to her that it's not going to snow there. And she's like, what? It's the United States. It's going to be snowy there. Of course. She's seen movies so, yeah. before. She's probably seen more American movies than you have, Paula. I'm sure she has, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what's funny is she's going to Las Vegas, which is clearly representative of the other 49 states. <laughs> exactly. She'll go back to Australia talking about how she's seen America, and it's all uh, lots of casinos. <laughs> that's that's right. And guess what? Because you are the person who's in the sun, we got to go to the person who's experiencing snow. I'm so happy that we got him on the podcast. The host of the Inspired Money podcast, Mr. Andrew Wong joins us. Dude, you made it. Thank you, Joe. It's so good to be in your mom's basement. Yes, I'm in sunny New Jersey, and uh, we've had one snowfall so far, just a couple of inches, but I, I got to use my snow blower. That's good. Uh, but it's so good to be here. I have three young kids at home. They're <laughs> ages five, seven, and 10. So to be in your basement is like a beach vacation for me. <laughs> that is, you're, you're hoping this is the longest episode ever, aren't you? This is a holiday. So thank you. <laughs> That's right. And you know what else is a vacation, Andrew? What's that? Letting HelloFresh do the shopping, planning, and delivery. That that was so bad. So all you have to do is hustle, bustle, and enjoy the holiday season. Thanks to HelloFresh.com for supporting Stacking Benjamins. Receive $30 off your first week of deliveries when you go to HelloFresh.com and use the offer code STACKING30. That's STACKING30, 30 bucks because you know us. We're also supported by MagnifyMoney.com. You've comparison shopped your holidays away. Why not spend five minutes shopping for those tools you use every day to improve your financial situation? StackingBenjamins.com forward slash MagnifyMoney to refinance student loans, find a better checking account, and from consolidating debt to playing the rewards game, StackingBenjamins.com forward slash magnify money we've got a great show man we got some headlines so let's get to them hello darlings and now it's time for your favorite part of the show our stacking benjamin's headlines our first headline comes to us from moneyish let's talk about 2018 shall we since it's our last show of 2017 
This one's written by Katie Hill. One big sign that Americans are going to be financial disasters in 2018. Andy, according to this uh, financial company, Fidelity, whoever they are, <laughs> only about- Follow the green line. <laughs> That's right. Only advertising works on you, dude. Only about one in four Americans, 27%, say they'll make a financial resolution this year, an all-time low down from 43% who vowed to do it in 2014. Do you think that makes us a disaster in 2018? You know, I'm super familiar with this Fidelity study. It's something that I read every uh, December and find some humor in it. I think that the author's numbers are a little bit low here. She said 27%, but I looked up the 2017 New Year financial uh, resolution study by Fidelity. They're saying 36% are considering a financial resolution this year, and that's, that's about the same as last year. And then the other takeaway is that the big number here is that it's the number of people who fail their New Year's resolution. It's like 92% fail to reach their New Year's resolution. So is this number really that important? I don't think that it's a sign that Americans are, are going to be in financial disaster this coming year. You're saying that if we're going to fail anyway, why set the one that we're not even going to go after? Yeah, I, I saw this headline as clickbait. I mean, I would definitely click on it. But then when I read that first paragraph, I'm like, how meaningful is the American New Year's resolution? It is not a clear signal or sign for the for the U.S. economy. You can tell, Paula, that it's Andy's first time on the podcast because he, he doesn't know our articles are always about clickbait. <laughs> Well, you made me and click he, on them. Right. And he uses big words like economy. I know, really. We don't, we're, we're, Paula's quickly looking that up for me. Well, it's not that many letters, Paula. That's right. <laughs> but it it's says, four syllables. But, but, but the author says here, Paula, that this comes at a time when more of us than ever may need financial resolutions. Credit card debt hit a record high in 2017 with more than a trillion dollars being owed. Student loan debts jumped 150% over the span of just a decade. Don't you think more people should be setting resolutions than less? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And whether or not New Year's resolutions specifically are something that people follow through with, if the information in this article is correct, this is an indicator that people have stopped paying attention to their finances. So whether that means that they're not setting a January 1st resolution versus any other random day of the year, it doesn't really matter. The indication that people have stopped paying attention is a bad sign. Yeah, I think that's the key, what Paul is saying there, Andy, that, that we just need to pay attention more in 2018. Well, I think it, maybe it's a sign that people are feeling pretty good, right? I mean, the market is, uh, people look at their 401k plan and their investment portfolio. They're not so worried that they feel the need to make that financial resolution. But my point is that if most people fail to see their resolution through, that doesn't mean that people shouldn't set a goal. They definitely need a goal, but maybe we should Maybe we should call it like a February financial goal and uh, don't call it a New Year's resolution because that's not going to work out. People need a goal, but just call it something different. Just if it's going to increase their chances just a little bit, I think we should go for that. See, and now, Paula, I love having Andy on the show because he's all about smoke and mirrors and just change the name like we are. <laughs> we hey, whatever call works. it the St. Patty's Day. Uh, oh, what's the synonym for goal? The St. Patty's Day. <laughs> Objective? Objective. That has there no you go. Ring to it. No, but it, but objective well, is such a big word. I mean, it fits right in. It's perfect. I'm not Irish, but I figure that uh, most people's goals on St. Patty's Day is, you know, to drink and have a good time, right? Uh, maybe we we don't do any of that here in the basement. <laughs> so I'm told. Yeah. So I'm told. yeah, yeah, yeah. Rumor has it. I just, by the way, I just googled synonym for goal: objective, aim, end, target, design, intention, intent, plan, purpose. But you know what, Paula, you have all of those on that note, and you seem to be somebody that does a great job of reaching the goal when you set it. How do you make sure, to Andy's point, most people set them and, and forget them and never do anything. How do you make sure you get your goal in 2018? Well, a couple of things. Number one, I actually uh, tr have recently been trying to stay away from the practice of setting goals. And specifically what I mean by that is that a goal signals a result that you want to achieve. And I find that if I focus on the result, uh, I can sometimes end up discouraged or afraid that I might not reach it. And so that sometimes ends up being counterproductive. So instead, what I like to do is I like to focus on the action. So, for example, rather than setting the goal of I am going to save X amount of money, I'll instead focus on the action of I'm going to 
cook at home more or I'm going to sell some piece of furniture that I can, you know, get $300 on Craigslist. Uh, I'll focus on those immediate actions instead. Andy, how about you over at your firm, Running Me Capital? Well, I'm entering 2018 with this thought. I want to set like a big audacious goal and one that sounds kind of crazy. But to Paula's point, I think once you make the big audacious goal, then it's about just small achievable goals that just keep you marching in the direction of the big one, because then hopefully you're not scared and you can, you can, you can put it into something that makes sense. I like that idea of chunking your goals down. Uh, I really like that and setting milestones. I think that's a big key to getting where you want to go. Let's move on to our second piece, which comes to us from Vice. Steve, uh, our engineer, is going to have a heck of a fun time uh, beeping out half the words we say in this piece because the headline itself this written by Ali Cotty is called Your 401k is kind of It's certainly better than nothing is the subheader, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't start demanding better. Paula, when I looked at, at this, you think the author has a point here that the whole 401k system is a little bit of smoke and mirrors? Well, I think the uh, criticism about lack of transparency when it comes to fees and when it comes to who is managing the portfolio is absolutely valid. I think one of the drawbacks of of employer-sponsored 401ks is the lack of control that people have over what brokerage it's kept at, what funds they can invest in, et cetera. That being said, sitting around criticizing your 401k is not going to prepare you for retirement any better. So if if your objective, aim, ambition, or other synonym for goal is to uh, be more prepared for retirement, well, how about do something about it? It's what we got. So use it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Andy, it's interesting because the author talks about the idea of financial planners often talk about a three-legged stool, right? You've got social security, you've got a pension, and then you have the 401k plan. Well, of those three, the author says one might not exist when the author gets to retirement that's social security. The other one never existed for them, meaning the three-legged stool is only a one-legged stool. In financial planning, what do you guys do about that? Before I even get into that, I have to say that I loved the headline. Maybe I'm really like a conservative, boring guy, but I loved the headline so much that I actually followed Ali Conti on Twitter. Did you I was really? Like, this, this is hilarious. Yeah, I laughed out loud. And uh, I actually thought that she was going to go in a different direction with her, her article because we are fiduciary advisors and I do look at a lot of 401k plans. So we help employers to benchmark their plans. And that that means like looking at the fees, looking at the uh, investment menu. I thought that she was going to complain that her employer is not putting together a good plan. And that's why she's calling BS. But that's not where she went. So I was kind of surprised. No, she she actually went in the other direction, just that this plan's not perfect, but it's kind of all we got. She even went into like fiduciary, which right. seems to be a stacking Benjamin's favorite topic. I hear that one come up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a recurring theme. It has been. We've had, well, with the rule here and the fact that we talk about headlines a lot, the fact that that rule kind of got, it appears is, is DOA now that's not happening. But let's go back to this idea of the three-legged stool. In financial planning, what do you do now? That Do you just admit that it's probably for most people a one-legged stool? Her three legs are what? Social security, the pension, 401K. and yep. yeah, the 401k, right? Right. And she was also pointing out that the pension funds are practically non-existent these days. Yeah. Yeah. So when we look at a client's like retirement plan, so I guess you're really looking at like a two-legged stool, right? You're looking at social security, you're looking at their 401k retirement plan, since that's the most common young people today. I'm middle-aged, but me included, we kind of figure that By the time we retire, there's not going to be much in the social security pot. So yeah, it does become a one-legged stool. And that's why it's extremely important that people address their 401k, that they're participating, that they're taking advantage of the retirement plan that their employer offers them. Because I think the data suggests that most Americans are not taking care of their retirement. And that means that they're not investing in their 401k and not even taking advantage of like a company match, for example. Paul, I was curious about this point, which is uh, James Altucher says fairly famously in the financial circles, 
not to use your 401k that we don't know to this article's point all the fees we don't know all the 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 stuff that's going on behind the behind the curtain with your 401k uh, there's a gentleman quoted in this article who says don't use your 401k for anything more than the match uh, Daniel Solon a securities attorney term financial advisor and author where do you come down you think those are right or should we should we take advantage of that tax savings as much as possible well, I think, first of all, if your concern is what are the fees, what funds do I have access to, you can research that. You don't need to spend the rest of the next many, many years of avoiding your 401k. You can spend an evening looking it up or you can t- go to HR and talk to them and, and figure out what's going on within your 401k. I absolutely think that everybody should get their company match because that is the best quote unquote guaranteed return that you will ever get. Um, It's a complete no brainer. So absolutely get the company match. After that, you can then put, once you've reached the company match, you can then start putting money into an IRA, whether it's traditional or Roth, or if you're eligible, an HSA account, if you have a high deductible plan that's HSA compatible, um, you can certainly look to other tax advantaged types of accounts. And then once you max those out, then sure, go back to your 401k because it's still tax advantaged. When it comes to fees, Andy, back to you. She says that her fees went from, uh, what was it? Somewhere around 0.28, I think, up to 0.75. I think, yeah, I didn't quite understand what she was saying there, but yes, I think so. She said something like that. Yeah, she said her fees jumped, but she said that less than 1% is considered good. Is that what you guys use as kind of a rule of thumb that if you've got less than a 1% expense ratio, you're probably sitting pretty? I think that that's a good rule of thumb. I'd like to make the point that I think that this article is sort of operating under the assumption that the 401k retirements all have really high fees. And from what I see, I think that the good news is fees are actually coming down and most employers are on top of it in making sure that their plans have um, good fund choices, low fees. I think that what employees need to look for is more and more plans these days, they're offering active choices, they have passive choices, and the employees are becoming sophisticated enough that they're looking for Uh, passive index funds that are paying extremely or that they have extremely low expense ratios. And those can be like 10, 20 basis points or lower. Yeah, I think that's a good place for us to leave it right there. But I do know that we did a headline that suggests exactly, Andy, what you're saying a couple of weeks ago, that fees are definitely coming down. So I guess if we're taking anything away from the headlines today, Paula, is it just that uh, Andy uses some big words that we don't really understand? Absolutely, like fiduciary and fees. <laughs> but and we super califragilist. <laughs> we we just keep saying fiduciary and fees over and over, thinking everybody's going to think we're cool. But but seriously, Paula, takeaways from these? Well, I think the takeaway from the four hundred one k article is whether or not you like it, this is what you've got. So save for retirement because it's better than not. Hey, that rhymes. And uh, the takeaway from the uh, the first article, the one about people not forming financially related New Year's resolutions, is. Whatever time of year you decide to do it, pay attention to your finances. And you're probably doing that because you're listening to the Stacking Benjamins podcast. Woo, Andy, your takeaways. Hello. Uh, My takeaways from the first one, the clickbait one. I think that the New Year's resolutions are not a sign that Americans are in trouble in 2018. I think that the economy looks okay. There's, There's the big word again. That corporate earnings look fine and that people should not be too worried about financial disaster. Uh, The second article about the 401k, I agree with Paula. Take advantage of the plan that you have. Uh, Take a look at the fees to make sure that your plan is, uh, you know, to to see if you have a good plan or a bad plan. And then you can you can act accordingly, uh, trying to decide if you want to max out what you put in the plan or have an IRA that you're funding separately. Waiting Upstairs with Mom is the co-founder and CEO of College Backer, Abby Chow. I'm, I'm excited about College Backer. When I first heard about it, I got excited and really wanted to invite Abby down to the basement because of the fact that a lot of people don't understand how to save for college. 
And Abby seems to be somebody who not only is super passionate about this that I'm sure we'll all hear, but second, uh, this program that College Backer uses really focuses on what we focused on in our headlines, which are, of course, uh, fees and performance when it comes to your college savings. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Abby at McKinsey. There's there's a big word, Paula, McKinsey. <laughs> and a very uh, well-regarded company. Yeah, prestigious place. She was a social sector fellow in education, in addition to serving financial services and technology clients and marketing and sales. Prior to that, she covered technology, media, and telecom, Andy, at this little company called Goldman Sachs. You familiar with them? I think I've heard of them before. It may, maybe once or twice. And she also studied business and web technologies at USC. Coming down to the basement, let's say hello to Abby Chow. And coming down the stairs to the basement, it's our new friend, Abby Chow. How are you, Abby? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for inviting me. Well, I'm glad you could come to Texarkana to tell us about College Backer, especially this time of year, right in the middle of holiday season, because a lot of people get a bunch of junk that they don't want. I'm going to get back to that. But how did you guys create College Backer? Was it something that you know you were frustrated with or was it you saw an opportunity in the marketplace? What happened? So it was definitely a frustration that we actually saw in our friends and family. So um, College Backer was really born from a desire to help. My co-founder and I both had tons of friends and family who just had kids and were stressed or confused or overwhelmed by the idea of paying for college, very understandably, since many of them had battled their own student loans or they were still battling them. Um, And they wanted to be able to save their kids from the same fate. But they were so busy as new parents, they didn't want to spend hours researching the best way to save for college. So most of them either didn't save at all or they might just use a regular, you know, checking or savings account. Well, it is frustrating Um, because even today, after 529 plans have been around, which is something you guys use, I still hear people say, so do you think I should buy savings bonds? (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. And the shocking thing is, About 70% of Americans have no idea what a 529 plan is and less than 10% actually use one. But, you know, you and I both know that a 529 is far and away the best way to save for college if you know that's what you're saving for. And we, you know, we are personal finance geeks. We wanted to be able to help our friends and family. We wanted to be able to set them, you know, onto the right path and give them this gift that would give them the gift of tax-free compounding, you know, for the next 18 years. But there wasn't really a good way to do that. And that's why we built College Backer. Well, it is funny because, you know, my initial thought when I heard about College Backer was, well, people could just save directly into a 529 plan. But like you said, nobody knows what a 529 plan is, number one. And number two, sometimes it's really difficult to get that done, like to save directly into the plans, a pain in the butt. Exactly. And there are a ton of different options out there, too. So even within the world of 529s, there's probably 100 different choices that you can make. Every state has their own, but you don't have to choose your state's plan. Financial advisors also can sell a 529 plan. So we just wanted to simplify the whole process. Well, let's talk about how it works then. So I assume I go to collegebacker.com and what happens? Yeah. So if you are a new parent, you start by signing up and just giving a little bit of your information and information about your child and your goals. And then we'll give you a recommendation for a specific 529 plan, including an investment portfolio. And we'll even help you set that up as an SEC registered investment advisor. Then we give you a custom link. So for example, it would be collegebacker.com slash Abby or rather your kid's name. And then you can share that link with family and friends and they can go there directly and give a gift into the fund with a credit or debit card. That was the cool part that I thought for me was that it's always been difficult for family to put money into my kid's plan, but you're saying they have their own URL, their own specific. So I don't got to, I don't got to give my relatives, uh, go to college back or click this button, click 30 different buttons. It goes directly to that one spot. Exactly. So we wanted to make it as easy as buying something off Amazon, you know, and the state of the art in a lot of the 529 world is you have to write a paper check and ask somebody for an account number and mail it in. So it's just, uh, we just wanted to make that so much simpler. With some blood. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> let's talk about 529 plans for a second, because we let's talk to the Uber nerds that listen to the Stacky Benjamin show. When you're evaluating 529 plans that work for individuals, what types of things are you looking for in the right 529 plan for me? 
Yeah, so a couple of the big questions that you should think about when looking at 529 plans are, one, does your state offer a tax deduction? For example, in Illinois, which is my home state, there is a tax deduction for using the Illinois plan, but I'm sitting here in California and California does not have a state tax deduction. So if you don't have a state tax deduction, choose any plan that you want and think about some of these other criteria. The other criteria are, you know, two, you want to look for a plan with low fees. Uh, this probably isn't a surprise to any of the Uber nerds on here. There's a huge range in underlying fees that different 529 plans might charge. Best in class is generally going to be around 20 basis points. But for some of the financial advisor sold plans, it can be well over one full percentage point as the underlying fee. Um, and then lastly, you just want to look for stable management and portfolio options that suit your needs. That's a little bit more of a qualitative criteria, but it does matter in terms of finding the right plan for you. And a lot of these 529 plans, Abby, have lots of different options. You help me choose which option's right for me. Exactly. And we base that recommendation off of the age of your child and your risk tolerance. So we're looking for a passively invested fund that is going to accommodate the right amount of risk for your time horizon and, and the age of your child. When I get ready to use the money for college, do I then call College Backer and you help me then get the money out? Or do I have to call the 529 plan you recommended and work with them? So we can also help with that process. So just going to the collegebacker.com website, you can request a withdrawal for you know whatever amount makes sense. Maybe it's a quarter for the first year and, and so on and so forth. And then we'll help you with all of the, the paperwork and, and things necessary to make that withdrawal. That all sounds fantastic, obviously, and I like the simplicity of it. But how do you guys make money? Because I, I assume that there must be some way that you guys make money. You're not just yeah. altruistic. It sounds, Abby, like you're being really nice to me. <laughs> but there's got to be something in it for you, too. Yeah, well, we try to be pretty nice in that as well. <laughs> But in short, we are asking you for a voluntary monthly subscription of zero to ten dollars a month. And you might be thinking, oh, my God, I've never heard of a financial product with that kind of business model. And does it really work? But the reason that we chose that business model is that our mission is to help every family in America save for college. And so that includes both people who are saving just a few dollars a month, as well as those who are putting in you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars every month. We believe that with this business model, you know, we can serve every family in the way that that fits your needs. So if you start off with, say, five dollars a month and then you have a month where your budgets are tight and you're spending a lot on Christmas gifts, for example, um, you can take that down to zero dollars and then come back later um, when you feel like you're back on your feet. It's funny. You're not the only time I've heard of that model. I use uh, something, well, fans of the show knows I use Rise Money. I'm not affiliated with them at all. You know, they're not a sponsor of the show. I just use their stuff and they use a similar model. I know for Justin and the team over there, that works really well too. Yep. Um, we love Rise and, and we hope that this is basically, you know, the beginning of a financial revolution um, with more companies uh, thinking about their business in this way. No, that's awesome. And so I go to collegebacker.com to set it up. And we've, you've got, you've been nice enough to give our listeners a special deal. That's, that's uh, very nice. Mom was very happy to hear about that. <laughs> yeah. So we would love to help everyone on Stacking Benjamins save for college. So if you go to collegebacker.com slash SB and sign up there, then we'll match your first $25 contribution. So if you start a college fund for your child and put in $25, we'll put another $25 in there. And also if you send a gift, to kickstart somebody else's college fund uh, with $25 or more, we'll also match that 25. So whether you're a parent or not, there's, there's a way that you can help a kid save for college. That was my next question. Let's say that parents don't have, so I want to give college backer to my nephew, but my brother doesn't have the account set up. I can still do 25 bucks. Yes, that's exactly right. So if you go to collegebacker.com slash SB and then hit the send a gift button, uh, you'll be able to just put a little bit of information about yourself the gift recipient, write a nice note, and then we'll send them all the information they need to get set up on College Backer and their account will already have the, the gift from you. There are people, it's the 22nd of December, there's people staring down at December 25th, a couple of days away, and they might not have done anything yet. I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm not looking in the mirror or anything. What's the, what's, the, uh, what's the turnaround on that, Abby? How quickly you, would my brother get that letter? 
you can send it immediately via email. So uh, nobody has to know that it's the 22nd and you haven't gotten a gift yet. <laughs> Excellent. That's so great. So whether it's to start off next year with a bang or last minute holiday gift, Abby Chow from College Backer. Oh, by the way, we will have that link again on the show notes at stackybedjamins.com. So if you're walking the dog or you're out on your run or driving to or from work, we've got you covered at stackybedjamins.com. Abby Chow from College Backer, thanks a ton for hanging out. Thank you so much, Joe. This was so fun. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and because this party's getting a little out of hand. I mean, these guys are lightweights. They don't know what they're doing like I do. I think it's time for someone responsible to take control and give you some sobering up trivia. How about this one? With the holiday coming up, I wondered on which holiday are more cars stolen in the USA than any other? I'll have the answer right after I tell Joe's mom's bridge club friend, Mabel, to stop dancing on the snack table. Well, OG and I and the gang here in the basement, we teamed up with HelloFresh, and they're offering all of us $30 off your first week of deliveries when you go to HelloFresh.com and use the offer code STACKING30. Everything comes pre-measured in these labeled meal kits, so you're going to know exactly which ingredients go with which recipe. There are three different plans you can choose from. I had the classic, OG had the family, and there's, of course, the veggie option, Last week, I had this creamy mushroom pork chop recipe with crispy potatoes and Brussels sprouts. And not only were they those little potatoes that I like, you're going to hear what a chef I am, but also the Brussels sprout recipe, unbelievable. The cool thing is you're not going to spend all night in the kitchen because the recipes only take about 30 minutes. And you can feel confident because you have pictured step-by-step instructions. So if you're not a big reader, this is also for you. Head to HelloFresh.com. Use the code STACKING30, STACKING30, to get $30 off your first week of deliveries. Thanks to HelloFresh for supporting Stacking Benjamins. Hey, stackers, we get used to those same daily routines, don't we? Wake up at the same time every morning, brush our teeth, park the car in the same spot at work every day, recite jokes in the mirror to be funnier than that jerk of the water cooler, or is that with just me? Here's one thing you shouldn't make routine, using the same credit card from the same bank just because that's what you've always done. Nick Clements from Magnify Money explains why. I mean, it's never been a better time, honestly, to find a credit card, especially given the lucrative sign-on bonuses that are out there. Chase just recently had 100000 on their reserve card. I, I think we're at a point right now where credit cards are extremely profitable for large banks, and they are really wanting to get more customers, and so they're, they're rolling out the red carpet. So I would just say, if, if you have had a credit card for more than two or three years, chances are there's a much better deal out there for you today. So why stick with that same old card with those rewards that haven't changed in years? You can use MagnifyMoney.com to always find best in class, including better interest rates. And don't only use Magnify Money for credit cards. Nick and the team have built the site from the ground up to help with personal loans, student loans, and mortgages. Average person saves $450 in interest when they hit stackcubedgements.com forward slash Magnify Money. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and this party just hit a new low. OG just told the worst elf joke. Okay, okay, fine. I'll I'll share it. What do you call an elf who just won the lottery? Wealthy. See? God, that, I told you that sucks, OG. How do you recover from that? I just, I didn't say it. I was just retelling a joke. I'm way funnier than that in real life. Well... Let's give it a shot with today's trivia question, which was this. On which holiday are more cars stolen in the USA than any other? The answer, according to the National Insurance Crime Bureau, there is one of those things. Anyway, they say the most likely holiday to get your car stolen is New Year's Day. Of course, if it's 2 a.m. New Year's Day, there might be something else going on, but we'll stick with theft because that's what you tell your friends. On that note, better not drive that night anyway. Take an Uber. That's the advice from your new best friend, Doug. See ya. And Andy gets it right. 
I hope that there are some nice parting gifts. Fantastic. Uh, Paula, what does he get? How about a free hug from uh, your mom? There, there it is. You get a free <laughs> hug from mom. That's... I got that already this morning. <laughs> I know. What a rip up. <laughs> know. Well, yeah. Bummer. Does he know about this? <laughs> yeah, stinks to be you. Welcome to the Stacky Benjamin Show, Andy. Set of steak well, knives. I'm glad that you talked to my mom. Paula, you had you you had a whole different train of thought that I thought was a smart one that it had to be a summer month. Yeah, I mean, it just uh, I put myself into the shoes of somebody who might be want to steal a car, and figured, all right, well, if I was going to go through the trouble of breaking into a car, when would I be most likely to do it? When it's warm outside, was, because, you know, I figured it's going to happen at night. So, you know, you especially want it to be warm. Yeah. It wasn't going to be 2 a.m. in Minneapolis that you're stealing a car <laughs> and New Year's, a New Year's Day. Hey, let's uh, help somebody out. Clearly, somebody had a wrong number here when they called us because they actually asked us a question, asked us for help. This is brought to you by Stacking Benjamin's Courses. Need some help? Get it from the people who you like to play along with every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Head to stackybenjamins.com. Scroll down to our courses. A uh, big one this year, Save 50, where you're saving 50% of your income. My business partner, Kathleen, did that, and uh, she and I teach you how to do that. StackingBenjamins.com forward slash save the number 50. Uh, question today, guys, comes from Brent. Uh, Brent's got a great one, especially for right now. Brent asks, is the Bitcoin bubble about to pop or should we be staking out a piece of our own? Andy, we'll go to you first. You staking out a piece of Bitcoin for yourself so that you uh, retire in the next 24 hours? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> I do not own any Bitcoin. So the, the FOMO is there, the fear of missing out. And that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 but do you think that we're in bubble territory? I think that we are. Like many people, I think that blockchain is super fascinating. It has huge potential to be applied to the security, like in financial services and retail and all kinds of industries. But the fact is that it's early. And if we remember back to the early days of the internet, it's super difficult to tell who the Friendsters and MySpaces will be. Uh, Facebook came later on. So we don't know. Is Bitcoin going to be the one or is it going to be something else? It's very difficult to know right now. Paul, I'm sure you've got every dollar invested in Bitcoin. <laughs> Every dollar that you pay me for appearing on this roundtable, Joe, is, <laughs> right. is the exact amount that I have invested in Bitcoin. We, we're giving you a 50% raise tonight, and you can put it all in Bitcoin. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Oh, great. It's, it's uh, by my entire 401k match actually happens in Bitcoin. Right. Nice. Right. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that is to say, for, for the sake of any listener who is wondering what we mean, I have also exactly zero dollars and zero cents invested in Bitcoin. And yeah, I agree. There's, there's, I've felt a hint of FOMO in the past uh, week or two watching, watching the crazy numbers. But I'm going to go back to the wisdom of Warren Buffett when he was not investing during the dot-com bubble. And his reason for that was because he said that he didn't understand uh, the technology companies at the time. And he didn't understand how they were valued, at, how they got the valuations that they had and how they were making the projections that they were. And so as a result, he completely stayed out of the dot-com bubble run-up. And everybody at the time thought that he was nuts, that he had finally gone senile and, you know, lost his touch. But he history proved him right. And, and I think, regardless of that one specific anecdote, I think the wisdom of don't invest in something that you don't understand is very sound. I don't really understand Bitcoin, therefore I won't invest in it. That's interesting. I want to ask you more about that point. But but I guess, you know, when you guys both say that it's a bubble, I, I don't really have any data. Um, you know, it's it's such a new thing to Andy's point. We don't know. It's early. We don't know who the winner is going to be. So I don't really know if it's a bubble because... Oh. Because Joe, to be clear, I also don't think it's a bubble. Uh, I don't. I don't know that it is or that it isn't. The point is that I don't understand it. Yeah, I and gotcha. if I don't understand it, then I can't evaluate it. Yeah, I do think though, Andy, to your point, that a lot of this run up is just people this feeding frenzy of hey, my buddy's doing it, so I got to do it too. That certainly to me is what it feels like. Is that what it feels like to you? I feel like uh, yeah, it is a bubble. I have a friend or someone that I work with and he's an accountant. He's super conservative. There's no way that he would ever put a penny or dime into Bitcoin. But his wife actually bought some Bitcoin. And I asked her, I said, do you know what Bitcoin is? Do you understand it? She said, no, I have no idea. And 
that's the kind of environment that I think that uh, that we're seeing. The people who are invested, they have to realize that there's there's risk because with this kind of volatility, sure, fortunes can be made, but fortunes can be lost quickly too. And uh, I think it's worth noting that the SEC released a statement this week that trading Bitcoin or initial coin offerings could violate securities law. Oh. So it's very much not clear on what's going to happen and how things are going to play out. There, there are many, many uncertainties. Wow. Paula, back to your point about not investing in, in things that you don't know. I, you know, I look at the efficient frontier and now, now, Andy, I just totally blew it. Big words. Yeah, because now words. we're in a bigger. hole. The, the no, words I, are getting bigger. I know I'm sinking the ship here because now I got to explain efficient frontier. But in modern portfolio theory, historically, there's been a portfolio at any at any risk tolerance in any uh, tax situation that has historically been the most efficient way to allocate your money, to diversify your portfolio. And sometimes there's things, let's take emerging markets, uh, where I'll use an emerging market fund. I don't know what's going on in all of those places, but I still think it's still an important part of my portfolio. Do you agree with that? Even though I don't really understand all the emerging markets out there, should I avoid emerging markets because I don't get them all? Oh, no. So when the conversation is around broad asset classes, such as emerging markets, U.S. large caps, anything that is a broad index fund style of investment, I think it's perfectly fine to to invest in a broad asset class without needing to understand the nuances of what's going on. Gotcha. There. You're but talking when you about are making a, yeah. yeah, when you're making a very specific choice about either an individual stock such as Nike or Coca-Cola or something like Bitcoin. Um, I don't think that a person has the a person should not make that decision unless they have the information that would allow them to make an informed choice. Uh, under what condition then, Andy, would you say, let's go ahead and uh, put put a bunch of money into Bitcoin? Put a bunch of money into Bitcoin. Well, for my clients, I cannot tell them to invest in Bitcoin. And I think it's worth noting that it's hard to include Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies into one's like conversation of asset classes because it doesn't trade like a stock or a bond unless you're buying a Bitcoin or cryptocurrency ETF to actually go to a coin exchange to buy Bitcoin. It's unregulated. I don't understand the process of buying Bitcoin. I've been trying to do some research just just to educate myself. And I'm told that if you buy Bitcoin, you should actually not leave it on the exchange. You have to move it to someplace else. And it sounded very complicated to me. So back to Paula's point, I couldn't understand the process. And therefore, I'm not going to own any myself. And I can't tell my clients that they should own any. Yeah, part of your fiduciary responsibility. Getting back to big words That's for sure. Yeah, I think <laughs> I'll we'll, get in trouble. <laughs> I think we'll leave it there. We also get letters here, and Donna clarifying something. Andy, you weren't part of this, but uh, Paula, you were here with our friend Chris Costello from Bloom. Donna's addressing something we talked about. Remember, Paula, we had somebody uh, who was working for a firm where they demanded that they roll over the four hundred one k, either roll over an old four hundred one k or an IRA to the new four hundred one k. Right. Yeah. And we were commenting on how we had never heard of uh, that type of demand or that type of mandate. Y yes. Well, Donna uh, sent us a letter. We also had a little discussion in our basement closed Facebook group. If you want to join that, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash basement. Donna says, I just listened to last Friday's show. I wanted to note some companies will make you roll your former 401k over into an IRA. I know that big four accounting firms do this for independence reasons. They will also make you report all of your investments and insurance policies on a quarterly basis. And it's funny, Paula, after she said that, I, I totally realized this is how long I've been out of the business. When I was with American Express, I just remembered that I had to do that. Uh, I had to I had to <laughs> roll my stuff at American Express, and it was specifically so that they could keep track of me. And then we had a gentleman from Merrill Lynch tell me at Merrill Lynch that they had to roll their stuff over to Merrill Lynch so that they could follow along. And it's to make sure that if you're investing in somewhere where you might know something that you shouldn't, that they don't get themselves in trouble too. Andy, is, is, has that been the case with you in your career? I didn't quite follow. Which company is requiring the IRA rollover? Is I, it the current company or the former company? Yeah, the new company. The new company is is requiring people to move uh, money from old companies into places where they can see it, where they can mm -hmm. where they can track it too, along with you. 
Uh, interesting. Yeah, I hadn't heard of that before. I thought that it was the opposite. I thought that the uh, former employers were doing right. that. And I do see that because sometimes those former employers, they want the old employees to leave the plan just to reduce the uh, plan operating cost. But it, it makes sense to me from a compliance standpoint. Right. Yeah. So it helps them stay away from nefarious stuff. Uh, good stuff. Thanks for that, Donna. I appreciate it. If you've got a letter for the show or you'd like to uh, get some help from us, call our voicemail. It's stackybenjamins.com. And right at the top of the webpage, you'll see questions for the show. And you just click that link and there you have it. Thanks to everybody who left, who's left reviews of the show. We get some crazy reviews. Thanks to all of you for doing that. Mom puts those on the refrigerator, so we appreciate that. I also appreciate you guys for helping us out this week again. Paula, as usual, thanks a ton. This is a blast. Ooh, well, you're, uh, you're welcome. Hope you're doing... I, I just gave you another 30% raise because we had so much fun. Ah, uh, thank you. I, you know what? We use half of it to invest in Bitcoin and the other half to short Bitcoin. Perfect. <laughs> right. You're going to... You're going to not put much money in it, but make it up on volume or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, how are you spending your holiday season? Clearly reading about Bitcoin. Uh, no, I'll, I'll be spending my holiday season. Like I, like I mentioned, my sister, who has never been to the U.S. before, is uh, coming to the U.S. with her two daughters. They're nine and seven. So I will be spending uh, this holiday season hanging out with them, showing them the uh, the sights and sounds of the U.S. of A. That's so awesome. What a great time of year to do it. So happy holidays to you. What's going on at Afford Anything these last couple of weeks of the year? On December 25th, we are running an interview with Will Bowen, who has started a movement around complaining less. So uh, <laughs> that is coming up, as well as an interview with David Bach, which is going to be coming up in the new year, as well as an interview with uh, Tanya and Mark, a couple uh, they blog at Our Next Life, and they retired at the age of 38 and 41, respectively. So that will also be airing uh, sometime in early January. I can't stop laughing every time you talk about complaining less, because I just <laughs> I just fall right into the trap of the obvious jokes. And I'm not going to do it again. I've done it twice in a row. We're not going to do it again. I will never complain about the obvious jokes, Joe. <laughs> so great. Andy, thanks a ton for for finishing off 2017 with us, man. Thank you for welcoming me to your mom's basement. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun. Well, so how in the Wong family, how do you guys spend the last couple weeks of the year, the holiday season? Well, I mentioned that we have three young kids, so we will be home for Christmas and maybe do some skiing. Awesome. But, uh, otherwise, the three kids opening up their gifts uh, and hanging out with our elf, Charlie. <laughs> of course. And then, uh, and then what's going on? I love your podcast, the Inspired Money Podcast. Tell everybody about it again and, and exactly what you got coming up here the last two weeks of the year. Well, I'm having so much fun with Inspired Money. Uh, we're delivering inspirational interviews, interesting people, valuable takeaways, and I am learning so much. So I'm having a blast. At Inspired Money, we say from making it to giving it away, Inspired Money means making a difference and creating something bigger than oneself, hopefully making the world a better place I just recently interviewed Colin O'Brady, who is a two-time world record mountaineer and uh, just an incredibly inspiring story. At age 22, he suffered an accident where he was burned and the doctors told him that it would be likely that he'd never walk normally again. And because of a positive mindset and setting goals, he has just achieved incredible things. So those types of stories and we actually extract money takeaways from that, if you can believe it or not. Yeah, I love how you fuse uh, stuff that doesn't seem to be about money into financial talk. It's great. And we'll we'll have a link to Inspired Money and to your website at runningme.com on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Guys, thanks a bunch for playing. Thanks Thank for you. having us on. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Sure thing, Joe. Why don't you get back to piecing together that table that Mabel just smashed to bits? I'll tell everybody what they should have learned today. First, your 401k? Yeah, it might not be the best, but it's hard to beat a match and the pre-tax nature of money. If you need money earlier, though, remember that 401k funds are restricted and you should only save for retirement with 401k money. Second, college? Yeah, it's expensive. Maybe a better gift than some toy would be to help a kid attend college easier. But the big lesson, don't ask to celebrate New Year's with Joe's mom because that'll just go in one year and out the other. 
<laughs> See what I did there in in one year and out the other. That's how it's done, OG. That's some stupid elf joke. In one year out the other. Oh my god. Come on, it's my last joke of 2017. What'd you expect? Nothing less than greatness. Thanks to Abby Chow from College Backer. Find out more at collegebacker.com or on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks also to Andrew Wang from the Inspired Money Podcast for joining us. You'll find Inspired Money right here, wherever you're listening to this show. Paula Pant appears courtesy of affordanything.com. When you're done messing around with us, who do you want to teach you some money tricks? That nerd who talks over your head or your favorite basement-based geeks? Kathleen Selmans operates our Stacking Benjamins classroom. And to make up for the fact that we don't teach you anything here on the show, she's created a whole lot of tools you'll absolutely love. Head to learn.stackingbenjamins.com for details. And use coupon code DougRocks for 10% off. Yeah, you're welcome. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at @sbenjaminscast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor Doug saying happy new year. What's your new year's resolution? Mine is 1080p. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist, Andy. The rules here, since you're the new guy, is what happens in the after show stays in the after show. We don't even talk about it, okay? All right. If either of our listeners catch you talking about it, they're going to be so angry. Mom or the other person. So let's let's talk about this. Our last show of the year, and you were talking earlier, Andy, about people, uh, about your kids opening up their gifts. And I thought we should talk about some bad gifts that we've received. And Paula, you've got one. I know you talked about this a while ago on the show, but uh, I don't even remember what the heck it was. <laughs> so I am, uh, I'm Nepalese. I'm Nepalese American. And back in October of not this past October, but the one before I went to Nepal and my aunt gave me the sari, which is like a traditional Nepalese outfit, which number one, when am I ever going to wear that? I, I live in Las Vegas. And number two, the one that she gave me, because I, I get, you know, I need a couple of them just for special occasions, like for weddings or for, you know, parties. But the one that she gave me was just terrible, like <laughs> itchy and cotton and a terrible, it was just everything that could possibly be wrong with it was wrong with it. But now I'm expected to wear it. Oh, so, no. Yeah. So lesson learned, or I, th I think that the takeaway lesson from this is don't give people clothing, particularly the type of clothing that they would then be expected to wear to parties or weddings or functions, i.e. clothing that is noticeable if they're not wearing it because ugh, it just puts them in this <laughs> like yeah uh, trap of then needing to keep it around and then needing to wear it at, at a time when they wouldn't. But is she the type of person, Paula, who would call you out on it if you didn't wear it and say, how come you're not wearing that sorry? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. She would. Oh, totally. Mm -hmm. Oh, see, that makes it worse. Yeah. Because then is, is there any possibility of just confronting it and going, you know, um, it, it really doesn't suit me. 
I mean, the problem with the sari is that you can't say that it doesn't fit. Right. right? <laughs> right, right, right. Like that's just never an excuse. <laughs> you could say it's too small. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Oh, no. Uh, uh, Andy, I'll bet you've never had the problem uh, with having a sari that looked horrible. I have not received a sari. No. Or a mu'u mu'u, for that matter. No. Well, you get one of those, you're in big trouble. Yeah, well, my wife's family is uh, from Hawaii, so ah. I, I might get a mu'u mu'u one year. Who knows? I I just love that name. I don't even know what a mu'u mu'u is. Well, it's more commonly known as a mu'u, but... <laughs> I, I had to say it in proper Hawaiian. That's that's <laughs> awesome. So what's the worst gift you've uh, received? Uh, you know, I'm thinking hard about this because I don't think that I've really received a terrible gift. But for my 40th birthday, my wife gave me a gift and I opened it up and it was the P90X videos. <laughs> and it, that's... it was sort of like a... <laughs> It was sort of a con job because she told me the reason I got this for you yeah. is that they're 30 minute workouts. So I took them down to my basement and I was determined not to have them sit on the shelf and collect dust. I'm like, I am going to do this for the 90 days. And I popped the DVDs in and I was like, you know what? These are not 30 minute workouts. These are 60 plus minute workouts. And then on Wednesdays, there's like an hour and a half yoga video and they're five days a week or maybe six days a week. I was like, this is nuts. And then I thought even harder about this. And I, why is it okay for her to give me P90X videos for Christmas? <laughs> like, I could not have turned around and given her like a thigh master, right? Like, that would be the worst possible gift <laughs> right. that you could give to your wife, right? Yes. Um, but in any case, I got the P90X videos. I did it for 90 days. My pants actually did end up like all loose, so it, it was good. But I have fallen off the bandwagon and need to uh, get back down to my basement. Does she know that uh, you weren't all that happy with getting that as a gift? I think so. Because <laughs> I told her, I'm like, these are 60 minute, 90 minute workouts every day. And how, why is this okay? I'm like, why, why is it okay for you to give me workout videos for, for Christmas? Paul, you ever have anybody give you a workout video? No, no. Although I did uh, back in college, I bought a workout DVD for $7 from Craigslist and never used it. See. So, yeah. <laughs> was it typo? It was, what was it? It was like an ab video or something like that. I don't know. I got to say, apps. I mean, while we're confessing here, I'll tell you that uh, there was a while there, the Cindy Crawford workout video was like my favorite thing to work out to. The music in that video and the, and the guy that she trained with were fantastic. And, you love uh, the music in the guy, Joe? <laughs> I did. I did. Not that there's anything wrong with that. No, it was, it was, it did a great music. I was like, uh, yeah, Cheryl would, would come down to our basement. We lived in Michigan. And it was like, wow, you're doing this. What, what are you doing? I'm like the Cindy Crawford workout video. Really? Great. Yeah. My buddy one year, he, he moved out of New York. He moved back to Hawaii and he gave me his, uh, uh oh, what's the thing called? It's the Chuck Norris, oh. uh, Christy Brinkley total gym. Okay. And I, I never used that. No, but it's sure looking on your shelf. You could tell everybody. But I got it yeah. for free. <laughs> yeah. Paula, did you do that? Did you imply that you were watching it? Did you put it in some place where everybody that came into your house saw it? And you're like, yeah, like you didn't lie to them, but just having it in a spot where everybody thought you were doing that. I think anybody who looked at my abs could be pretty <laughs> confident that I was not using that. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's especially so especially when you when you wear your sari. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the most ad revealing outfit of them all. Uh, yes, your aunt called you. Called <laughs> called you on not using your ab workout video. What if she gave you a sari and an ab video? I don't I, I don't know. <laughs> there She's you like, go. The sari is aspirational. You can wear this after you do that. That's right, right. <laughs> well, Joe, right. you you've defined the worst possible gift. That combo. <laughs> I, th I, th I think that's it. We did it. All right, guys. Joe, now I know what I'm getting you for Christmas. Oh, man. <laughs> I can't wait. Here yeah, we go. And just to clarify, it's not only the app video and not only a sari, but it's a sari that is like rough material, apparently. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like and rough an, and itchy and just uh, <laughs> With an app video, you're never going to do. Perfect. <laughs> Perfectly that's, horrible gift. That's, that's how they're supposed to be used, I'm told. Even the East German judge thought we stuck the landing on that one. It's a paperweight. 